Okay, so it's December 2020, and uh, this is the end of 2020, and it's been an awful year, but I couldn't quite figure out exactly how to end this, but I figure the most appropriate right way would be to finish up with the news that I've got. Uh, and I've got good news and I've got bad news, and I'm going to separate them into two videos. So this one will be the good news, um, and I'll link up to the bad news one. The good news is um, there's a proposal right now to transfer uh, control of certain genetically modified animals from the FDA to the USDA. And that may not sound like a big deal, but with my project, to try and uh, help dogs do use genetic engineering to cure dog genetic diseases, uh, the number one obstacle that I've run into is the FDA. Uh, I've spent hours and hours talking to them. Re they want to regulate any intentional genomic modification of an animal as a drug, which means if I use CRISPR to take a mutation and turn it back to normal, they want, from then on, that animal's genome is a drug according to the FDA. Which means, if I use something like sperm-mediated gene transfer, and I fix, say, a litter of Dalmatians and cure hyperuricemia, their genes are now normal. I've removed the mutation, they're now normal. Each puppy separately would be a drug. Each puppy separately would need an NADA. I could use, I could, um, <clears throat> I could take them all uh, under one INAD, Investigational New Animal Drug File, which is $100,000 a year, um, unless you get a waiver, which I have been for the last few years, take all of those puppies, and then take them and uh, establish one lineage. You have to do it as a product, because the FDA won't work with you if it's not a product, and they won't let you do anything if you don't work with them. So you have to make a product, or the FDA will just shut you down. Um, but so you say, okay, here's my genetically engineered drug. Um, this dog's genome, so the puppy himself is a drug, which also means all of his offspring have that drug. And so I'll take all those puppies, and if I want each one of them to be available, then each one of them has to go through the NADA process, which is another $100,000 a year per puppy. Um, so if you have a litter of six or seven, six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year, on top of the INAD fee, which is another $100,000 a year just to really talk to them. And then you're supposed to do safety testing and clinical trials and all this sort of stuff and spend years and years and years doing this. And then finally what you have is you have a dog or each one of these dogs is now probably too old to breed. So it probably just shuts it down entirely. But even if they were uh, young enough to breed, because normally this takes like 10, 20 years, but let's say you can still do it. Their puppies would then be drugs, which would be approved by the FDA already. But that means the sale of every puppy would have to be filed with the FDA forever. So that would be every dog, if you wanted to cure every dog's genetic disease, and almost all dogs carry some kind of genetic disease, that would mean every dog ever bred to really do it right would need to go through the FDA's process, which is completely absurd. Um, we're talking about like billions or trillions of dollars that would be required in decades and decades and basically they just want to shut it down completely. Now, the absurdity of all that has been a big problem, and I'm not the only one who's been pushing back against it. Animal agriculture, uh, animal agriculture people, animal agroscience people have been pushing back against it. Veterinary researchers and all kinds of stuff have been pushing back against this because it really does just shut down our ability to use genetic engineering to help animals or make animals more helpful to humans. So. What we need to do then uh, is we, if we can get the FDA to change the regulations, the problem is the FDA doesn't have the authority to regulate breeding or regulate um, animal agriculture. What they have the authority to regulate is food, drugs, and cosmetics. And since dogs aren't food, dogs aren't drugs, and dogs aren't cosmetics, if they want to regulate genetic engineering of dogs, they have to decide which one of them they are. And so they've decided that dogs are drugs, which of course, is ridiculous. So, uh, in order to get past that, if we could transition to the USDA, who currently regulates uh, genetically modified crops, um, and the way that they regulate genetically modified crops are if is, is risk-based and science-based. So, it's not about the method, because with the FDA, for example, they're not just trying to 
prevent mutants from getting out there because they only want to control certain techniques and intentional use of certain techniques, so like CRISPR, so what they call uh, modern molecular methods. And they specifically exempt things like random mutagenesis. So I can take dog sperm, bombard it with gamma rays until it mutates, inseminate, have a bunch of mutant puppies, send them everywhere with their mutant, their mutations and genetic diseases, and the FDA doesn't care because the FDA is not trying to prevent risks to animals. What they're trying to do is control access to the technology. So if you, but if you want to use CRISPR, you have to talk to the FDA, even if the thing you do is completely harmless or if the thing you do takes harm away. So if you just take a disease and make it normal, um, that shouldn't be regulated because the dog at the end is normal. That's not how they're regulating it. They're regulating the technology that you use to create the dog, not any risks that the dog may be exposed to or the environment or people. And that's not what they're supposed to do. But the USDA has always had a much more science and risk-based approach to things. So if I could take two types of wheat and breed them together and select for 40 generations and get this one wheat gene and otherwise identical to this stock of wheat, then they don't care if you use CRISPR to plop it over or if you use a crazy amount of selective breeding or whatever. So if you can use normal methods, then the fact that you use CRISPR or something similar to it is really irrelevant, which is how it should be because you ought to be regulating the outcome, the risks that it presents. Because if you could make it without using CRISPR, you just did use CRISPR, then you should regulate it the same, regardless of the technology that you use to create it. Because the thing that you're trying to regulate is that wheat stock and whatever risks it may present. So if it's gonna present risks when it's created by CRISPR, it'll also present the same risks when it's created by any other method. With that mentality, the USDA has been very successful in regulating genetically modified crops in the U.S. Uh, by saying, you know, we're going to look at the risks that they offer or the risks that are created. And unfortunately, they are not over the animals. That's because the FDA just kind of claimed it. With the proposal to make the transition to the USDA, that would mean that a genetically engineered animal, as long as that animal did not create something new, like if I put a jellyfish gene in a dog, then the USDA would be like, okay, this is something different. This has never been, we should look at the risks, which is not totally unreasonable. But if I just take like a, a coat color gene, like say I took the short tail gene from uh, corgis and put it in Rottweilers. Well, I could do that by breeding a corgi to a Rottweiler and then breeding the offspring back to Rottweilers and selecting for the short tail for 40 or 50 generations and somebody's already done that. Um, or I could just take that one mutation, pop it in a Rottweiler, and it'd be 100% Rottweiler with that one mutation. It'd be born with short tails and nobody would ever dock a tail again, right? So, um, if you could do something like that, just moving genes around or taking mutations and making them healthy, uh, the USDA is like, that shouldn't be regulated any more stringently than any other form of dog breeding because they look at these genetic engineering technologies as breeding technologies, which is really what they are. They're just breeding methods, and that's all they've ever been. They're really sophisticated breeding methods, but they're breeding methods. And so if we can get the USDA to take it over, that would be really powerful. The trick is they have a list of animals that they're looking to take over. It's like cows, pigs, horses, sheep, those sorts of things. And dogs aren't on the list. Now there is one little loophole in the language. Um, everything else, basically, that's not on the list, they're tossing back to the FDA. But they mention agricultural animals intended for human, you know, consumption, you know, fleece production, fiber, leather, or labor. And horses are on the list. We don't eat horses here in the U.S. I guess some people do, but most people don't eat horses here in the U.S. And they're, but their primary use in agriculture is labor. And the same thing's true with dogs. So if we can get working dogs over to the FDA or the USDA, that might be enough loophole to start working with. So I'm pretty excited about the opportunities that that transition may create. Now there's a public commentary period. This isn't done yet. There's a public commentary period. that's gonna go for the next 60 days starting on September 28th. Uh, I'll link stuff in the description of this video uh, and it will, mean that people uh, 
the general public, the, the USDA is, is looking for the opinions of the general public on this policy. So you'll be able to read the proposal and you'll be able to leave a comment saying, I think this is a good idea, I think this is a bad idea, I think dogs should be included, those sorts of things. And so I'll leave some bullet points and I'll leave some, and I'll leave a link so that you can follow it and you can explain, ideally in your own words, your thoughts about um, the value that it could have for dogs to be included uh, among the animals that would be regulated by the USDA in a risk and science-based approach instead of just a methodology-based approach. So, uh, with that said, anybody watching this video, please look down in the link, or in the, in the description, follow that link and help us out because hopefully sometime between now and 60 days they'll make an amendment if they see a lot of public interest in that idea and include dogs in that list and then that means people like me, dog breeders like me who are using genetic engineering will be free to actually make a difference and I'll be able to teach lots and lots of dog breeders how to use these methods to cure genetic diseases in dogs at the breeding level so that the dogs are just born never having been infected by or never having been affected by this genetic disease. So if we can perfect the methodology then generations of dogs from now on can be free of literally hundreds of genetic diseases that humans caused that humans ought to be fixing. But the people who have the money and the power and the technology and the means to fix it don't have an interest in fixing dog diseases. They have an interest in fixing human diseases. They're trying to fix cystic fibrosis and things like that. They're, they're not interested in fixing hyperuricemia and Dalmatians or any other genetic disease in, in dogs. The people who are interested in fixing those things are the dog breeders. The trouble is dog breeders don't have the sophisticated tools, technology, or the regulatory freedom to do it. That's what I'm fighting for, and I would really appreciate your help. Thank you.